Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and then 15 through 16, which can be found printed in the insert in your bulletin. The Sign of the Covenant. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestors of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations, Kings of people shall come from her. Then our Gospel reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and, he, and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit, forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them 
the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So we're on a theme here about covenants. A covenant is an agreement between two parties where both benefit. We just had the covenant last week with Noah and setting a bow in the sky to remind Noah of God's promise to never again destroy the earth by flood. And the covenant that was made with Jesus at his baptism where God claimed him through water and spirit as God's only Son, reminding us of the same covenant that God makes when we are baptized through water and spirit that we are chosen as God's beloved sons and daughters. And here we go back to the beginning. The covenant God makes with Abram and Sarah. It's very important for us to note in this, and the writer of Genesis, we give credit to Moses, the writer of Genesis tells us very clearly that Abram was 99 years old when God made this promise that you shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations, that your wife, Sarai, will bear a son. 99 years old. Abram was... 75 years old when God first came to him and made this promise. 75. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born to Hagar, his his wife that he took, the servant of his wife, Sarai. 24 years Abram waited for God to make good on his promise. And then finally, at 99 years old, God finally says, it's time. Anybody interested in having a child at 99 years old? <laughs> Absolutely not. Now, Sarah, according to Scripture, was only 90, so it wasn't that bad for her. (laughs) Thank you for laughing. This is all to remind us of the amazing nature of who God is. And of course, we think about this and we think, how on earth does a 99-year-old and a 90-year-old have children? But you see, when God makes promises, God keeps them. And when God makes promises, God is faithful. 
And it took 24 years for that promise to come true. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggle with waiting. I'm not very good at it. 24 years seems like an awful long time to wait. Abram had been waiting at age 75 when God had first appeared to him and still had not had a child. Waiting is not an easy thing. God's time is not often our time. Don't we know that now? I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of wearing this thing. I'm tired of us having to be social distanced. It's discouraging waiting. And yet, I believe it's either, for me, it's either hope or denial or maybe a mixture of both. But I believe in the depths of my heart that we will get through this. Because God has promised us life. Life abundant. Now God does not promise Abraham and Sarah that birthing this child at the ripe age of 90 and 99, God does not promise them that this will be easy. God does not promise them that there will not be difficulty and suffering. Abraham already has a son by the time Isaac comes around. Imagine the difficulty and the strife that Abraham has when Isaac finally comes around and he has to, at the wish of his wife Sarah, expel Ishmael and Hagar. He does so with love and care for them and for their well-being. There is suffering that goes with this story. Why the writers and compilers of the lectionary chose to leave out some verses is beyond me. But there is great suffering that goes with this story. And it's not just the suffering of an old man and an old woman having a child. You see, in Genesis chapter 17, we left out a few verses, and I want to go back and look at those because, well, there is some real commitment that goes with this covenant. In fact, God is about to ask Abraham for a serious commitment. We stopped reading at verse 7. Picking up with verse 9, God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between, you, between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. God is not kidding. Blood will be spilt of human flesh to keep this covenant. God does not promise anywhere in Scripture that being part of God's people will make life easy. God does not promise wealth or health. 
God promises presence and mercy and faithfulness. But God does not say there will not be suffering. That is part of life. We can all expect it. No one can escape it. That's one of the things that this pandemic has reminded us, is it doesn't matter who you are or where you live, it doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are, it doesn't matter the color of your skin or what language you speak or what God you believe in or don't believe in. This virus can kill you. I was driving the other day with Joel, and he goes, Dad, why are the flags flying at half staff? What happened? I had to remind him, Joel, half a million people have died from this pandemic. That's more than the population of Eugene and Springfield wiped off the earth since this pandemic began. Suffering and pain is an unfortunate part of life. And boy, we know it too well. We all experience it. And Jesus reminds us that he also undergoes suffering and pain. He tells his disciples that the Son must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and that he will be killed before he's resurrected on the third day. Now, it would be easy to blame Peter for rebuking Jesus. But after all, you have to consider Peter had already confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He is Messiah, that He is the Son of the living God, and this can't happen to God's own Son. It just doesn't seem right. It doesn't fit with any idea of justice and rightness in the world. He should conquer death, not experience it. He should be above pain and suffering, not in it. I'm reminded very much of the paradox of suffering and life through the birth of our eldest son, Joel. We were all excited, full of anticipation and joy, waiting for our firstborn son. And of course there was with all the excitement and the anticipation, a mixture of fear and trepidation, wondering if we were up to the challenge to care for this new life. And like many new parents-to-be, we attended birthing classes at the local hospital where Joel was born in Dubuque, Iowa. It was quite an experience. They taught us all the breathing things that you do and talked about all of the things that happen uh, in or, or could happen in the process. I was impressed that all the dads stayed for the whole class. I have to admit, on more than one occasion, I was wondering if I was really going to get through this, and I knew that I didn't have the toughest part. And then we got to the part where it was time for us to practice. 
And the nurse who was leading the class said, in order for us to make this as realistic as possible, we are going to simulate pain. And I'm thinking, how on earth do you simulate pain? She gave each of the men in the room two wooden clothespins and invited us to stick them to our earlobes. And we did that. It doesn't hurt at first. Leave them there for 10 minutes and 15 minutes and 20 minutes while we're practicing breathing. I guarantee you the men were experiencing real simulated pain. To which one of the women replied, if you think that hurts, you ought to clip it somewhere else. No one said bringing life was going to be easy. No one said living life was going to be easy. Life comes with a great deal of suffering and pain. And isn't it wonderful that we have a Savior who is not above it, but in it with us? I often find myself saying there are things worse than death, and Jesus experienced that, I would say. Crucifixion would qualify at, at, at the top of my list. And then death itself is horrible enough. And he experienced that as well. So that when we find ourselves in the midst of our suffering and pain, we can say with confidence, God knows what I'm going through. And this was not just simulated pain with clothespins on the ear. This was the most costly pain of a parent watching their son suffer and die. Thankfully, I have been spared that pain. But I've walked with many who have not. I'm reminded that seven years ago, in February, I was at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City with a young family that my age and I was baptizing their eight-month-old son who had just been declared brain dead from a SIDS episode. They removed life support and he passed away. Fast forward seven years later and during this pandemic, just a few weeks ago, this same mother who lost her newborn son seven years ago lost her mother to COVID. And later that same day, a few weeks ago, lost her mother's mother. And just the other day, she had the funeral service for her mother and her grandmother on the same day, in the same month that she had buried her son seven months or seven years previously. Friends, the suffering and the pain is real. But so is the promise of God. 
so is God's faithfulness. So is the hope that we hold on to in the midst of suffering. That God has not abandoned us or forsaken us, but that God is here with us and will bring us through it. It is a good day for the sun to be shining. It is a good day for us to remember that God is the God of promises. God is the God of rainbows and baptism. God is the God of resurrection. And that is the journey we are on. We're walking these 40 days of Lent not just to beat ourselves up and remind ourselves that we suffer and that life is hard. It is spiritual training so that we are ready to celebrate resurrection. So that we are ready and that we know exactly what it cost God to save us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but would have life eternal. This is why Jesus says, if any want to become My followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Me. Jesus is not saying Follow me and leave all your troubles behind. Jesus is saying, take your suffering and come with me as I suffer and follow me. For we're not alone in this. My dad would often say, You might as well do what you can with what you have in this life because after all, hearses don't come with luggage racks. You can't take it with you. This is what Jesus is saying. What will it profit them if they gain the whole world and forfeit their lives? What can they give in return for their life? Take up your cross and follow me. The amazing thing that I have found about suffering is that our suffering leads to redemption. I have experienced serious chronic pain in my life. And boy, I know what it feels like to be delivered from that. And it's amazing how our own pain helps us be present with others in their pain and their suffering. Because you know how it hurts. And so does God. He knows how it hurts. And still His promise is good of resurrection, of life, and hope. And for this we give God thanks and praise. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith as is printed in the bulletin this morning. This is the good news that we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved if we hold it fast that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day 
and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Friends, let us put our faith and hope and trust in the one who is with us in our suffering and delivers us to life and life everlasting. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with all of us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.